We are going to continue with a lecture that is called Shamanism 2.0, Psychedelic Profiteers and the Recuperation of the Transcendent with David Nichols. And he is a moderator for the DNT Nexus community and editor of the Nexium. He has presented on scientific and social aspects of psychedelics across the USA and internationally at venues from music festivals like Boom to academic conferences. Please welcome David Nichols. Thank you, it's really great to be here. Thanks for coming out. I know it's late and the music has started, so let's just get going. The current landscape of psychedelic culture presents a diverse terrain full of fascinating research, vibrant art movements, divine experiences, and quite a bit of cognitive dissonance. As we find ourselves in the middle of this rapidly shifting topography, <clears throat> where decriminalization, legalization, transformational gatherings, psychedelic medicines, and a plethora of other buzzwords are becoming more and more common, it's important to not give in to the excitement of mainstreaming psychedelics. In many ways, these are exciting times, but if we examine what's going on under the surface of the pop culture and increasing media awareness of these plants and compounds, as well as the experiences they facilitate, a, numbering of, a number of disturbing trends are immediately apparent. <clears throat> I think that the recent psychedelic resurgence of the past decade or two has seen widespread intellectual laziness, consumerist goals, and other issues. Feel-good sound bites have been substituted for critical thought. The commodification of ceremony appears to be more popular than creating personally meaningful rituals. And the marketing of psychedelics and the experiences they can facilitate stands in stark contradiction to many of their commonly espoused themes. But a lack of structural analysis is only one component of the problems with many of the ideas that seem to be increasingly commonplace within psychedelic circles. The following quotes are some examples of the kind of thinking, and magical thinking, that can accompany psychedelic experiences, especially initial trips. All of these quotes were taken from interviews with a person who, after their initial psychedelic experience, decided to open an online media outlet focusing on disseminating information about psychedelics. I think many of us here can probably relate to that sensation of wanting to spread the gospel, I know I certainly felt that way in the wake of my first experiences, and given that I'm here talking with all of you, I guess clearly I still feel that. But the problem isn't so much the desire to share information about these experiences and the plants and compounds that facilitate them, but the combination of naive and ignorant statements that get made and are made with a lack of systemic analysis of the problems or issues being addressed. So this first one, We've been told psychedelics are drugs. A lot of these psychedelic drugs are medicines, and they've been used in natural cultures to purge traumas. A lot of these natural cultures don't know what anxiety and depression are. They don't have words for those in their culture because they've been working with these medicines for so long. So now, even if we ignore the false dichotomy between medicine and drug and context and what makes a medicine a drug or a drug a medicine, this type of imagery of the noble savage, of the imagined remote tribesmen, of a so-called natural culture who is unaffected by the ills of the modern world, is both racist and ignorant. Do psychedelics show remarkable potential as trauma therapies? Absolutely. But to take that potential and create an imagined notion of anxiety-free cultures that don't have words for depression because they've been dosing psychedelics for so long is incredibly problematic, especially if you consider the actual events taking place in the areas where many of these imagined remote tribesmen could be projected to live. Now consider the actual indigenous people who live in Ecuador's Yasuni Basin, one of the world's most biologically diverse areas. In 2013, the Ecuadorian government approved oil drilling in Yasuni and actually recently started uh, the first 200 wells. Now, Ecuador has been dealing with pollution and other issues from oil drilling since the 1970s, so it seems both illogical and rather offensive to claim that the indigenous folks living in such a situation are 
free from anxiety or that they may have access to drugs that will magically cure them of whatever traumas they may encounter in the process of this energy extraction, as though dosing is somehow an antidote for the despoliation of a physical living environment. Now, I know that this list of quotes is kind of long, so I'll give you a little time to read it, and then I'll address some of the themes that are present in them. So even if we ignore the assertion that self-healing or psychedelic healing trumps Western medicine, this series of quotes evidences the problems that accompany making claims that lack structural analysis. First, just because we do drugs doesn't mean we change anything. Drugs are not inherently good or inherently bad. They're inherently drugs. The Aztecs took mushrooms and engaged in ritual human sacrifice. Charles Manson and his cult had no problem taking LSD and murdering people. Psychedelics are tools. This is precisely why integration and intention matter. But if we examine these quotes further and we look at what's actually being said, there's a lot of contradiction as well as questionable assertions. For example, being productive citizens within consumer society means contributing to the very, system that contributes to ecological destruction and leaves people feeling socially alienated, isolated, and depressed. So the notion that psychedelics will simultaneously heal people and then make them good little producers and consumers, integrated nicely into society, raises questions and also contradicts the assertion that psychedelics facilitate complete 180s. And speaking of those 180s, If we look at that last quote, there's not really many specifics given about what is considered to be a responsible investment. So it's hard to really engage with the claim, but considering that most capital investment perpetuates the horrors and abuses of capitalism, even when invested in so-called green or sustainable or conscious companies, um, we have to understand that, that, generally speaking, industrial processes are not ecologically sustainable or environmentally beneficial. Can opening a responsible factory or beginning to produce conscious consumer products actually benefit the environment more than if those products weren't created, than if those companies weren't started? Who benefits from allegedly clean technologies that have dirty origins? You know, we may all want to have so-called clean energy from things like wind turbines, but then I think we have to ask ourselves, what about the places in China where rare earth metals are mined and refined to make those turbines a reality? You know, where the air is, is poison, where the water is undrinkable. You know, how clean is clean and for whom? And just as with sustainable industrial technologies, the prospect of bankers and stockbrokers moving to the jungle to start retreat centers you know, really raises so many questions about cultural appropriation and ecological integrity and power relationships in this world of neo-colonialism that presenting it as a clear-cut good really doesn't make any sense. For me, these are the absurd statements that result from viewing psychedelics and these experiences as inherently good and in a vacuum, divorced from the socio-political context in which they exist. The point of this critique is to demonstrate that while psychedelic integration is generally discussed in the realm of personal understandings and lessons to apply in daily life, if we follow psychedelic insights to their conclusions, or at least think through their broader implications, it should lead to more than trite cliches and platitudes. For me, perhaps one of the most bizarre and troubling areas of commodification and appropriation is that of ritual and ceremony. I would contend that whether we're discussing psychedelic ceremonies or daily routines, ritual at its ideal should be personally meaningful and or serve a functional purpose. Whether we consider morning routines or ayahuasca ceremonies, if someone asks you why you engage in a particular behavior, there should be some personally meaningful answer, even if, as in the case of something religious, perhaps it takes some broader context to fully articulate. 
take, for example, the Jewish tradition of eating unleavened bread or matzah during Passover. This stems from a series of practices aimed at commemorating and memorializing the, Jews, the, the biblical story of the Jews' enslavement in and exodus from Egypt. According to the story, when the Jews were finally able to leave Egypt, they did so in such a rush that the bread they were baking didn't have time to rise. And so they were left with this flat, crispy, wafer-like, and none too pleasant result. Now, the practice of eating unleavened bread, or matzah, lasts for a predetermined period of seven days. It accompanies a number of other ceremonies and rituals aimed at preserving and memorializing this uh, story. And ultimately, from an external perspective, you know, this ritual of eating matzah doesn't have any intrinsic value on its own. Additionally, it seems pretty difficult to argue that, you know, this particular practice has much cultural significance to non-Jews, especially when you consider that even the best tasting matzah tends to fall far short of the worst crackers you can find. So then, what does matzah and ayahuasca ceremonies have in common? Ultimately nothing, but that lack of shared similarities is what makes things very interesting because while we don't see Gentiles flocking to have authentic Passover seders and uh, engaging in other rituals of, of that particular ceremony, we do see tons of people flocking to retreat centers and traveling shamans in search of the authentic ayahuasca experience, as though such a singular construct actually exists. Now, sure, you could argue that if matzah had the same psychoactive effects as ayahuasca, we'd see a hell of a lot more people uh, flocking to satyrs. But for the moment, let's stick with the ceremonial components and put the psychoactive effects to the side. Having met numerous people eager to engage in ayahuasca ceremonies, I always find it interesting how many of them claim to know what makes a ceremony authentic or what makes a good shaman. You know, according to them, he must have agua de florida and mapacho. He must blow the mapacho on the crown of your head at precisely the right moment while singing Icaros calibrated to your unique situation. Does he utilize la flema? If so, great, perfect. Uh, does, does he brew strong enough? Because, you know, ayahuasca tastes really bad and if you have to drink more than once, you may have a bad experience. And they go on and on and on. And yet, if you ask many of these people about the diverse cultures that use a wide variety of plants throughout Latin and South America, you get these stunned looks of surprise. Aren't there only two main plants, they ask, seeming to have no awareness? But the surprise quickly evaporates as they go back to telling you about the authentic retreat centers and shamans that they plan on seeing. Of course, there are more rules to be followed. The shaman must abstain from salt and sex and alcohol and other drugs. He must only work with whole plant medicines so as not to disrespect the plant spirits. He must be free of the baser human intentions and on and on and on. And yet, even when I've shared stories with some of these people that evidence exactly how much cultural diversity there are or there is between some of these groups that have long-standing histories of ayahuasca use, they seem to shake it off with little to no interest and go right back to their same narratives. It's almost as if they have little interest in the fact that these cultural traditions vary significantly among these groups. And despite their lack of experience or knowledge, they seem unable to acknowledge that making these statements about what is or is not proper or authentic is damn near impossible when talking in broad strokes about general ayahuasca uh, ceremonies held by abstract people. For me, I think there are two main things that make these encounters so troubling. First is the fact that it seems to me that many of these people find it comforting to dehumanize the subjects of their interest. They turn them into caricatures based on their own projections about cultures that use ayahuasca. Rather than attempting to understand or even engage with the complex and interconnected and unique lineages in many of these cultures, they seem more satisfied to just turn it into their own projection. And secondly, they appear to lack personal engagement or agency for their own experiences. It's almost as if they believe that by playing voyeur to another culture's practices, they can just be along for the ride even though it's their own nervous system with which these chemical cocktails are interacting. 
Now, the dehumanization aspect reminds me of a parable that Geronimo Munoz shared in a talk back in 2011 entitled Ayahuasca and the Gringos. And his tale goes something like this. Imagine there's an old-style cowboy out in Texas who raises cattle and horses. You know, he's, he's got kids who are totally plugged into pop culture. They've got TV and internet. They like uh, hip-hop. They understand what their father does, but they're not really excited in it. You know, they don't really care, and they get annoyed when he goes on and on about his days and what he does. And so one day, this millionaire German shows up on their front step. And he's got tons of money and tons of free time. He speaks English, but not very well, and he's absolutely fascinated with cowboys, like completely enthralled with anything the father does, like, wow, a real cowboy. So, you know, at some point, the father gets somewhat swept up in the German's admiration. He's got this new audience who's really excited about what he does, and, you know, he's got money to boot. So the German hangs around for a couple months, and. He's okay, but he's not quite the same. You know, he's, he's a bit different. He doesn't speak the language perfectly and misses a number of things that get said. He likes his food prepared in a very specific manner. And at times he gives the old cowboy these looks, like he doesn't really approve when the cowboy drinks alcohol or when he comes home from a long day of work and maybe gets into arguments with his family. And as this relationship builds up over the months, eventually, you know, the old cowboy gets kind of sick of the German. But then a few more Germans come, and a few more. And since the old cowboy lifestyle is dying out, all these Germans are running around and having a really hard time finding real, authentic cowboys. So then one of them gets this idea and posts up a sign. Cowboy school. German spoken, Euros accepted. And, you know, he thinks about all of the things he didn't like about the old cowboy he'd been with, and, and he thinks to himself, you know, I really, I could play the role of the cowboy much better and do, do all of the things that I wanted to see. And so once he starts doing that, you know, all of the Germans who are looking for exactly that type of cowboy start flocking to him. And so you wind up with this bizarre dance of a culture packaging and selling a caricature of another culture back to itself. And what's more, because the Germans had this preconceived notion about what it was to be a cowboy, it becomes hailed by them as more authentic than the actual cowboy culture it's attempting to emulate. And I know the parable itself might seem kind of silly, but the reality is that these very things are taking place in the real world of drug tourism. These dynamics are by no means limited to psychedelic tourism. We see these throughout the institutions of dominant culture. But to me, the realm of psychedelics is uniquely situated in that these experiences are direct experiences that are available to anyone who's interested in them. You don't need someone else's ritual in order to find personally meaningful insight in psychedelics. You don't need someone else's cultural objects to experience the divine mystery. You just need a willingness to see what's behind the curtain. So it seems to me that we need to create new modes of engagement around these substances and experiences, rather than working to stitch them into dominant culture where they can be recuperated by capitalism or industrial civilization. We need to make our own meaningful rituals and narratives, rather than attempting to extract them from cultures that have suffered the ills of colonialism and imperialism for hundreds of years. So what could a culture of collaborative, psychedelic mutual aid actually look like? To be honest, I don't have the answers, as I think the only real answers to this question come from the practices we engage with as individuals and collectives in our daily lives where we live. But that said, there are already projects and attitudes in play that point in some directions worth considering. So in contrast to the commodification of psychedelic compounds and ceremony, what would it be like to openly share these plants and the experiences they generate? Consider Share the Seeds. This is a project dedicated to sharing and trading ethnobotanicals around the world. Literally anyone can participate and create their own ethnobotanical garden. So I wonder what it might look like to take that one step further and start bringing plants and seeds and other live botanicals to local festivals where they could be traded with each other or perhaps gifted to folks who have yet to start their own uh, gardens. 
For anyone who's interested, the website is www.sharetheseeds.me. The second question that comes up in this realm of thinking is, how many of us are accustomed to tripping on our own, or in groups, outside of tourist traps or retreat centers? How many of us have our own ritual or ceremonial components that we use for our personal experiences or those we share with friends? What could it look like to explore and share ceremonies that consist of these personally meaningful components? Is it really more authentic to travel halfway around the world to play psychedelic voyeur than to anchor these experiences in our daily lives where we live? In any group of people, it's not unusual to find that each person has something they can share with the group. For me, some of my most meaningful experiences have stemmed from precisely those ceremonies that were comprised of individuals each sharing their own personal touch. Not only has it made for great experiences, but it's also enriched the relationships of all of the people involved. Rather than returning home from a retreat center with faint memories of fellow customers and participants, it provides new opportunities for sharing, engaging, and recollecting with your traveling companions. For me, reuniting with these psychedelic collaborators at different times and places has presented some of the most meaningful experiences in my life, whether it's just to reflect on the times we've shared together or actually build new things, work on new projects, I can't overstate the meaningfulness of those interactions to me. Considering that psychedelic experiences are directly and subjectively encountered, the rise of psychedelic entrepreneurs and gurus is a somewhat absurd phenomenon. How can someone else tell you what you experience? How can someone else tell you what makes your experience authentic? You know, I think that we as human beings are meaning-making creatures. We take significance from the events we encounter in our life, including those psychedelic experience. We find the significance in our actions, and it's up to us to find ways to apply that significance to the world at large, rather than sitting back and waiting for someone else to tell us what to do. But the unfortunate reality is that organizations set up to mimic indigenous cultures and, and practices do exist. Consider the denunciation of Alberto Jose Varela and his company Ayahuasca International by the Cofan people of Colombia, which provides a glimpse into the increasingly widespread practices accompanying the commodification of ayahuasca and other ethnobotanicals. Ayahuasca International consists of a network of companies and internet entities that Varela refers to as the first multinational corporation dedicated to ayahuasca. His business model employs aggressive marketing techniques, including significant investments in advertising and social media, with the aim of commodifying ayahuasca, generating market demand for the plants, and taking advantage of the ignorance and vulnerability of many people. In an irresponsible effort to expand the scope and range of this endeavor, he started the European Ayahuasca School, through which potential facilitators are given superficial courses, which ultimately result in people with little to no experience leading ceremonies and ultimately putting people at risk. Unsurprisingly, a growing number of people have described reprehensible business and ceremonial practices by this organization. Now, two of the major critiques made by the COFAN are that Ayahuasca International markets ayahuasca ceremonies by fraudulently alluding to supposed authorization from the COFAN, and that this organization has turned ayahuasca into uh, a lucrative business practice, thereby threatening the lives and um, health of people who participate in these ceremonies. The Kofan contend that Varela's claims uh, of approval are completely fraudulent. And, you know, I, I think that there's, there's some very interesting stuff that they've put out. There's an open letter that I would definitely urge anyone who's interested in this to read. But even if they weren't contending Varela's claims, I think that we should ask ourselves who owns culture? Who has the ability to grant permission for someone to select cultural components for explicit commodification? And is it possible for a single representative or a group of representatives to offer such permission on behalf of an entire culture? And then what does it mean to purchase cultural trappings from profit-seeking middlemen like Varela? 
So in addition to his organization, there's also Ayahuasca Healings and a number of others, but Ayahuasca Healings has also been known as Ayahuasca USA. For a number of months, this organization was in the headlines of various media outlets, having labeled itself as America's first legal ayahuasca church. Ultimately, Ayahuasca USA has paused its US uh, activities, but I believe they're still operating in South America. But the problems with the organization are numerous. First, there are no legal grounds for the claim that it is a legal ayahuasca church in the US. And even if there were, it's certainly not the first as both the UDV and Santo Daime have been operating for some time with uh, governmental approval of their ayahuasca. Second, Ayahuasca USA is structured as a multi-level marketing scheme that collects personal information and requests thousand dollar donations, all while claiming that they don't engage in any exchange of services for money. The various uh, claims made by Ayahuasca USA and its founder have a lot of issues around how safe their, their assertions are, as well as um, the validity and the vetting process for their facilitators. And considering that the owner has a history of running internet-based marketing operations while paying remote workers pretty much nothing, or this is what he claims while, while he goes skiing and surfing and enjoys other things, you know, I think it's really important to question who exactly this person is and why he's doing what he's doing. It's also worth noting that Ayahuasca Healings attempted to solidify its legitimacy by claiming to have created a legally recognized chapter of a Native American church. However, if you examine the history and the documents that are available, really what you find is a, is a series of organizational reshufflings, claims uh, about legal access to cannabis and a few really slow moving lawsuits against the US government dealing with sacramental cannabis use and a number of shady and outright fraudulent characters who all claim they're legitimate, but, uh, you know, aside from the mounting evidence of uh, fraud that continues to appear. So in these and other cases, we have clear examples of profit-driven organizations that are using psychedelic experiences to lure people into spending exorbitant amounts of money on ceremonies. One of the main arguments they make to justify these costs is that their ceremonies are authentic. Whether they claim this by alluding to indigenous approval or certification of their practices or by couching authenticity in terms of training from the plant spirits or apprenticeships with master shamans, the mere fact that these organizations are operating outside of a local cultural framework and our capitalist ventures raises significant questions about what it means to be authentic, especially when a major driving factor of these organizations is the desire of psychedelically naive people to see what all the fuss is about. Presenting abstract cultural archetypes for voyeuristic consumption is, at best, authentic to imperial and colonial civilizations, not the indigenous groups these organizations claim to derive their authenticity from. This approach to psychedelic experience cries out for reproach, not only because it does real-world harm to people within the broader psychedelic community, but because it presents an ersatz psychedelic paradigm a forgery in which building new psychedelic paradigms is at best an afterthought. Rather than incorporating psychedelic rituals and experiences into our lives in pragmatic and personally meaningful ways, these organizations attempt to sell us a prepackaged and sequestered notion of what a psychedelic experience is. I think that we need to collectively build collaborative frameworks for working with these compounds in our daily life where we live, outside of capitalist and consumerist frameworks. However, without a clear sense of why we seek out psychedelic experiences, creating new paradigms for psychedelic use may not be a desirable or even beneficial exercise. <clears throat> I won't presume to know why anyone else here chooses to use psychedelics or any other substances. My psychedelic use tends to fall into a handful of categories, ranging from therapeutic use, to experiences of the divine, hopefully artistic uh, inspiration, 
as well as ecstatic pleasure seeking and you know quite frequently it's a mix of a little bit of everything so wrapped up in all of my own intentions for my use of these substances is the various material that i encounter in these spaces these are things like the ecological messages that have come with a lot of my mushroom use um, the interpersonal lessons that have accompanied my ayahuasca use or the sheer existential questions that tend to accompany DMT experience. So I use psychedelics in part because I think they offer glimpses of some of the best qualities human beings have to offer and raise significant questions about what it means to exist. I think they offer tremendous insight into ways of being that offer incredible potential for action, especially when we examine the current socio-political terrain. But of course, in order for there to be any effect, there has to be action, which of course takes place after the experience. So I use psychedelics because for me, they offer an alternative to the alienated, atomized, splintered norms of daily life within this paradigm of industrial capitalism. When I see news stories alleging that microdosing psychedelics can provide economic success or op-ed pieces by millionaires that want to discuss the potential for psychedelics to help startups become more disruptive in whatever fields they're operating in, my first response is always suspicion. I don't doubt that psychedelic experiences these folks have had are personally meaningful to them, but from my perspective, it feels like they missed the point. That's not to say that there's a singular message to psychedelic experiences, but there is a clear disconnect between claiming affinity with the interconnectedness of all life, or stating that everything is love and that we're all one, and running massive business ventures that literally would be impossible without widespread ecological destruction and human exploitation. So consider a recent film on Huachuma, or San Pedro Cactus, that was put together by a California-based entrepreneur. In discussion of his film, he literally says, Huachuma is the medicine that might bring the whole planet together. Yet, this very same person used his family wealth to start a marketing company and uh, ultimately, uh, sorry, an investment company, which he used to raise capital for other companies that were looking to start various uh, product lines and, and ad services. And after that, he went on to start a different company focused on selling health supplements, exercise apparel, DVDs, all sorts of other things. And, you know, I think it's worth noting that the family business that made all of these endeavors possible was actually oil and gas extraction and refinement. So here we have a person whose very position in society is predicated on ecological destruction and consumerism, claiming that psychedelics will bring us all together. Personally, I think that this example is particularly poignant given that this person not only has the means to avoid perpetuating the abuses of industrial capitalism, but he's also making active statements about psychedelics bringing the whole planet together. The incompatibility between industrial capitalism and bringing the world together is actually quite simple. Sustaining industrial civilizations requires truly horrific processes. The structures and institutions of capitalism guarantee that the brunt of these processes will be disproportionately borne by the most vulnerable members of society. It's not an accident that we see companies avoiding environmental regulations and dumping industrial waste into the water supply when the fines for illegal dumping are less expensive than the technology used to contain or remediate such waste. It's not an accident that we see the undesirable components of industrial civilization like landfills, mining operations, refineries, and other uh, problematic structures constructed in economically vulnerable areas where the people who live there don't have access to or influence in the political process. It's not an accident that the starting capital for American capitalism was secured through slavery and genocide. Capitalism requires, and has always required, the exploitation of people and the environment in order to generate profit for a tiny minority. If we examine the societies in which we live, we find that alienation and isolation abound. 
We're cast into competition with each other from the moment we're born, told that if we don't secure the resources we need for survival, someone else will take them from us. We're perpetually told that we're not good enough, that we don't have what it takes to be complete human beings, that we lack some essential element of ourself. We're told that in order to be the best versions of ourselves, we have two options to climb over everyone else until we are at the top of the ladder, or to purchase the products that will somehow transform us into complete and wholly functional human beings. This mindset is reinforced as we're pitted against ourselves and each other on a daily basis, in school, at work, and every time we turn on the mass media. For entrepreneurs to simultaneously laud psychedelic experiences as heralding a new era of peace, love, and interplanetary connection, while actively engaging in the destruction and behaviors that they claim psychedelics will save us from is nonsensical. Or rather, it makes sense only when you consider the benefits that they stand to gain from such an approach. But then what does this mean about their message? What do they mean? Why do they give these messages? Why do they appear and why do they somehow and sometimes seem to present them with such vehemence or belief? You know, I, I wondered if they were naive or confused, cynical and malicious, but it seems more that these are just means to an end, that perhaps these messages simultaneously allow them to feel better about the grim realities we're all facing together while also managing to make a little money. So let's go back to the Wachuma example for a moment. Consider that the same entrepreneur asserting that cactus might bring the whole planet together runs a business engaged in the manufacture and distribution of health supplements, workout DVDs, health apparel, weights, and a variety of other things. Even if we ignore the fact that the entire operation is predicated on extractive industry, just the consumer products leave us with quite a bit to examine. Because all of the raw materials for these items come from somewhere and have to be shipped to somewhere else for manufacturing. All of the factories used to produce these items emit waste and have their own ecological footprint. All of the packaging and shipping materials generate more waste and utilize more energy. And then of course there's the workers along the whole way who get paid pennies on the dollar. But I guess don't worry about them because, you know, once they can take Wachuma with us, perhaps once they save enough to come to a nice retreat center, then we can all enjoy the world as one. For me, it can't be both ways. It can't be that somehow, by unexplained and so far non-existent mechanisms, psychedelics will fix all of the problems created by the structures and institutions that we live with and participate in in our nine to five lives. It can't be that we're free to engage in destructive processes for a nine to five jobs, but then our weekend ayahuasca retreats or our evening San Pedro ritual or our holiday mushroom trip will somehow right all of the wrongs and bring us all together. This type of thinking just doesn't hold up under scrutiny. So I'd like to propose an alternative. I'd like to propose that psychedelics are not magical panaceas that will bring us all together to sing Kumbaya and forget our daily troubles. I would like to propose that if these kinds of people were serious about their assertions, we would see it in their actions. We would see it manifested not by them becoming podcast gurus or selling thousand dollar shamanotic certificates, but actually working towards dismantling the institutions and infrastructure that drives wedges between us and our fellow human beings. We don't need gurus or would-be leaders to tell us that psychedelics might unite humanity, especially when they can't tell us how, especially when they can't even take the first baby steps in a direction that could be understood as working towards those ends. Talk is cheap especially when you have a lot to lose by going against the system that you're currently in, especially when it offers such extreme rewards to a tiny minority. So what does it mean that these figures seem to be increasingly tangled up with some of the larger psychedelic organizations? To state the obvious, it means that you have to think for yourself. It means that just because we all do drugs doesn't mean we're all on the same side. As with any tool, the fact that you use psychedelics is less important than what you use them for. For me, the question always boils down to one of utility. So what can you do with it? What do you do with it? And that's a question that we all have to answer for ourselves. The psychedelic resurgence is well underway. 
the institutions that we've watched grow from small labors of love and tiny policy projects are quickly becoming the faces of the psychedelic movement. If we're actually invested in the dialogues that are going on about what benefits psychedelics offer and what impact they can have culturally, who these organizations are, what they do, who they associate with, and how they actually conduct themselves in the real world should be in, of interest to all of us. Consider MDMA. I'm sure that many of you here have some stake or at least interest in what decriminalized or legal therapeutic MDMA could look like, recreational or otherwise. I'm sure many of you have personal stories about the benefits that MDMA has brought into your life. Personally, I don't get effects from MDMA, so I'm not amongst you, but based on stories that I've heard from people and the various studies that come out, there's no doubt that those, those stories exist. So I'm kind of curious that what you all might think of the fact that in the US, one of the largest psychedelic advocacy and research organizations is working with the Department of Defense in order to pursue studies into the use of MDMA for PTSD in combat veterans, especially those with the treatment-resistant PTSD. Now, don't get me wrong, I think that veterans or anyone else suffering from PTSD should have access to whatever compounds they need to help them process their trauma. However, I do have questions and concerns about what it might look like to have governmentally sanctioned PTSD pills for combat veterans especially if the success rates are as high as current data suggests they could be. What would it mean if a government could tell its citizens not to worry about the psychological effects that combat veterans might experience because they have a magical cure that will alleviate all those symptoms once they get home? What would the implications be for the troops, for the people against whom they're deployed, for all of us at home and abroad? To me, it sounds like the premise for some sort of horrible dystopian sci-fi. But, you know, this notion of, of the sterilization of the psychological torment of war, the infliction of untold anguish without the mental feedback responses that have typically accompanied such atrocities and the resulting social outcry they tend to generate. I'm not saying that this is what medicalized psychedelics will look like, but I am saying that we can't divorce these substances from the socio-political realities in which they exist. Whether we're talking about drug advocacy groups, psychedelic entrepreneurs and gurus, or our own trips, context matters. Meaning is not made in a vacuum, and these experiences don't carry a singular or inherently good message. I think we all have to ask ourselves some difficult questions about the increasing popularity of psychedelics, as well as our own use. Ultimately, we find ourselves standing at a unique point in history. Perhaps now, more than ever, the importance of structural analysis and critical thinking in the realm of all things psychedelic cannot be overstated. Each of us carries with us the lessons and insight that we have gained through our psychedelic experiences. And as we encounter increasing numbers of psychedelic profiteers and questionably motivated psychedelic celebrities, we must ask ourselves what we find valuable from these experiences and how we can apply them and act in ways that propagate them meaningfully in the world around us. No one else will do it for us. Thank you. So now we have some time for questions. Uh, right up in the front, easy place to start. Um, earlier on, you mentioned uh, a company that sort of commercialized the, the ayahuasca usage by uh, creating some sort of school. Um, and I was wondering if there are uh, cases uh, of recorded fatal incidents or permanent harm done in some way to, to the people. From the uh, European ayahuasca school? Exactly. So yeah, I'm not familiar with the exact uh, outcomes of the various facilitators that were run through the, the EAS. Um, so that's actually, that's associated with Ayahuasca International. And there's a whole list of, of resources. That has been a fast moving case, I guess over the last year and a half, two years at least. Um, and for, for more information on that, I would definitely suggest checking online. Uh, I know that the, uh, the COFAN and several other groups 
published, um, there was a, a large open letter and there was also some more detailed explorations of what had gone on. Um, I do know that there were at least a few cases where there were uh, facilitators who had no experiences whatsoever, or no experience or minimal experience and there were some dicey situations in ceremony, but I don't have the specifics about what actually occurred and if there were any you know, fatalities or serious long-term injuries. Um, don't you think that uh, sometimes action guided by self-interest uh, is better uh, than no action at all, especially when we're talking about relatively safe substances? When you say uh, action by self, you mean like like taking it on yourself and uh, no, I mean they they did a business out of it. They they don't they might not care about the uh, the end user that much. Uh, they might care about making money. But uh, overall, it, it is beneficial to everyone. I, I don't think it's beneficial to everyone. I think that it's, it's problematic, A, when you're commodifying someone else's culture. I think it's problematic that this person is claiming to have authorization from an elder, especially when that has been disputed by not only that elder themselves, but also like a series of other people to the point where this community felt that it was necessary to write an open letter to let people know that, no, this person is not practicing with you know the authenticity or uh, authorization from this organization, I think beyond that, I think we frequently see that when money gets put uh, as the as the goal, as the focus, right? You were talking about how they made this a business endeavor. Um, I think we see extreme problems with that. So in the U.S., you know, it's something I'm always surprised, right? Like when I talk to folks in in Europe, very few people people get shocked when I tell them that we have private prisons, right? We have we have prisons that actually exist that get a federal funding to run um, prisons where they're then paid based on the number of people that are incarcerated. So someone similarly might say, well, isn't it good that we have somewhere to, to put these people? But the issue, aside from the problem with, with drug prohibition and the other thing that leads to the extreme incarceration rates in the US, is the fact that, no, it's not good that we have somewhere to put these people because it's motivated by profit. So we see an incentive to lock more and more people up because profit is the name of the game. So if you are not actually invested in, you know, like there's no reason if you wanted access to, to ayahuasca that it has to be done through some person claiming false authenticity and then selling you the plants. There's no reason why you couldn't grow your own plants. You know, on most continents there are what some people call ayahuasca analogs. You know, I shared share the seeds. Um, there are plenty of other uh, ethnobotanical distributors and people engaged in varying levels of practice that are not actually pushing through Facebook with mass marketing campaigns and looking to turn this into a truly consumer enterprise. And personally, I think that that holds a lot more hope than just trying to pump as much money out of it as possible. Thank you. Back there. Here. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned just recently MAP's uh, collaboration with the OD with regard to MDMA. Um, it reminds me quite a lot of Halpengate a little while back. Of what? Halpengate, John Halpen, who. Ah. Um, right. And um, it seems like the argument is that the ends justify the means to some extent. I know that Rick's worked incredibly hard to get to where we are now, and I wonder whether you've got any response from him, like how he justifies it himself. Like, so I haven't had the chance to have a conversation about that with, with Rick. Um, I would be interested to see how that would go. Um, Maps has worked with a couple snitches, and I think that that's problematic. I think the fact that they've had Crystal Cole um, doing online surveys, uh, especially I don't think it was an encrypted link or anything like that. I find that incredibly problematic. I think something that we tend to forget in this society uh, in this culture is that most of us, you know, except for the few that have the blessings of the state to actually work with these compounds, most of us are criminals. And I think people use a lot of flowery language to get around that or to say, oh, it's not really, you know, it, it's legitimate use or, oh, there's some, some greater spiritual calling. And yeah, that, that might be the case. But in terms of, you know, the only people that have the ability to declare people as criminals are, you know, states. And the states have declared that, that we as users of these substances are criminals and I think that uh, as a criminal population it behooves us to have a a more cogent analysis of why snitching creates problems and I know that with Crystal there you know there were a number of, of 
issues that people like to say were mitigating factors and that justify it. And perhaps, you know, that's another discussion that could be had. But really, I, I think that we let, there are a lot of things that are let go because the ends justify the means. And personally, I think that's kind of scary for, you know, what the ends end up looking like. I, uh, I'm just curious, um, I'm, I'd like to hear maybe a little more about your message from this uh, presentation because um, I had an insight when I came to the Boom Festival that I came by car and as I was taking my bag out of the car and walking and I realized how I did, I think that I myself am to oil and I believe so does, so does everyone else here even though here we are talking about saving the world and creating a new uh, planet and so on, we're still very much addicted to the system that we're in. And I don't see a way out of it. I'm just wondering what your message is uh, with the psychedelic plants. Because you're saying that, you know, these profiteers, they're, you know, who, who are they to say that, you know, the, this, this plant is gonna save the planet when the, the, their money comes from the oil. Uh, but, um, um, I, I have no idea, uh, you know, how to go forward with, from the situation that we're in, um, you know, with the, with these plants. I think there is a solution, but maybe you could uh, give me a bit more of your message so that maybe I could come back with more hope. Sure. So I wish I could give more hope. Um, personally, I'm not so optimistic about the state of things. I think there's a lot that we would have to give up to find ourselves in what might be considered a sustainable position, and even then, who knows. Um, for me, whether we're talking about the plants themselves or actions that, that we can take, I think examining our local context is super important. Um, you know, the message that I would have around uh, psychedelic or entheogenic plants would be to grow your own. You know, most of them are very simple to grow. Mushrooms are incredibly easy to grow. Um, as far as, as taking on dominant culture and what that looks like, there's a range. I mean, you know, I, I know people are in different places and can offer different support. One thing that I've discussed in the past would be seeing some uh, cross-pollination, let's say, between, say, psychedelic and activist communities where, you know, seeing the, the therapeutic potential of these compounds, what would it look like to be able to have some cultural interchange between folks that are on the ground engaged in um, whatever you want to call them, defensive measures, sabotage, eco-terrorism, I suppose, uh, and, and folks that are, you know, engaged in, in this work with these compounds. One of the things, you know, like, in the U.S. it's gotten super repressive and it's now a felony in some states to even interfere with the extractive industry. Um, where like if you were to chain yourself to the to the entrance gate to an oil refinery you could get hit with a felony and be looking at serious jail time so i think it's important that you know there are people that are running around uh sabotaging extraction sites there are people that are engaged in on the ground resistance uh it's an incredibly small number and um you know there's been incredible repression in the u.s against that I think finding projects and people that can be supported in whatever ways are available to you. You know, if you're not somebody that's, you know, willing or able to risk that because you have families or other things going on, yeah, that's totally legitimate. But at the same time, like, at the point where you see people engaged in trying to secure their, you know, clean water or access to other basic human rights, I think it's important to find ways of supporting them of finding solidarity. I mean, at the point where we've got world leaders meeting to to try to agree that, oh, the climate will only raise two degrees, like, who the hell are they to determine that? Like, the arrogance in, in that is, is so tremendous that I think that as we're looking at this sort of, at, we're looking at that as the dominant approach, um, I think in a lot of ways we're screwed. Hi David, uh, thanks for your very insightful lecture and your hard work on DNT Nexus. Uh, it seems that 
all conscious um, altering consumables, be it psychoactive substances or even technology, can be monopolized and um, monopolized by uh, profit driven corporate firms. Uh, I bumped into M the DJ Merkaba last year who was about to embark on a five day darkness retreat and um, I met several other people that did one in caves and they claim after about day three your brain releases endogenous GMT continuously. Yeah. That's kind of a questionable assertion. I'd like to see some papers on that. <clears throat> okay. um, but perhaps um, ultimately we need to look beyond psychedelics to ways to um, release and harness like endogenous psychoactives well so i think the i think the endogenous psychoactive spiel is a little tenuous i mean we know that there are endogenous psychoactive compounds like there's not a question and a lot of people like to 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 go with the strassman oh it's produced in the pineal you know which he then tries to articulate no it was just a theory and and if you want to get into it right there they haven't yet shown inmt i don't think in the pineal which is the actual methyl transferase enzyme that's responsible for synthesizing dmt there's good evidence it's in the lungs. They found it in some other animals, but again, rats are not humans, which I think is something that's very important to remember when looking at a lot of these uh, studies. And so I, for me, like with, with claims about like dark room retreats and, you know, I have no doubt people are experiencing things. I mean, you can spend time in an isolation tank and truly fabulous things happen. Um, but I think we need to be cautious about attributing the effects to mechanisms that we don't actually know enough about. Um, I'd like to just connecting the dots with that. Um, uh, what can we get? Because I think yeah. maybe some other folks have questions. Okay. So if, if we can get to the question. Um, you kind of answered it. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> we have over here on the right, or my right. Where I worked with uh, Trinity de Guzman and their facility. Yeah. Is it a bit dodgy? Yes. But if I wouldn't have worked with them, I'd probably be a banker in London. So I think it came at a price, but it was beneficial to the world. Sure. And I think so, that's a really interesting point, which I think sort of gets at. Some of what was in the in the question about like hope and all of that, right? Where we, we live in these contradictions. And for me, I guess the simplest distillation of that is to throw the question of, out there uh, of, you know, what is the body count of a hospital, right? I think it's easy for all of us to agree that perhaps the greatest good that industrial civilization provides is modern medicine. And yet, if we look at what it actually takes to stock and run a hospital, there's actual mortality associated with that, right? You need the high-powered magnets for your MRIs, you need all of the concrete, um, you need all of the, the various electronic components. Then you've got, you know, the, the hospital close to me is actually run off of a cold coal-fired power plant. So, you know, in West Virginia, they're blowing the mountaintops off so that they can get the coal to then run this, and in the process, they're polluting rivers, they're creating all sorts of ecological destruction. Yet, at the same time, right, the hospital is saving lives. For me, it's not so much is the hospital saving lives or not, but examining that it's not about the hospital saving lives, but whose lives are being saved, right? Who has access to that medical care? Who gets to benefit from that? So in the same case as this, like I, I appreciate that you benefited from that, but how many people were taken advantage of? How many people did, did Trinity tell, oh, you know, if you can't even afford $5,000 as an initial donation, clearly you're not serious about this in an attempt to get them to cough up you know, their life savings. How many people were put into, in jeopardy by folks who may not have known exactly what they were doing? And what is, the, what is the resulting effect on people who are trying to do good work, on people who are trying to spread awareness about these things, on folks that are actually looking for ways to, to push the legalization forward in the US? Personally, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in decriminalization and autonomy than legalization. But I, I heard that. Uh, actually, I heard from some of the ICR staff that Trinity received a letter from the DEA saying, "Hey, we know what's going on. You need to knock this off. But uh, if you go ahead and apply for a, a 
an exception via the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, you know, we'll see what happens. So, you know, we will see what happens, but I think it's important to consider questions about populations and, and you know, I've benefited from modern medicine and at the same time, like, it does come with a cost. Doesn't everything come at a cost? We all came here, or most of us came here by car, so we all yeah. use petrol. The laptop you're using was probably made in China to benefit of other people. Totally. So and I'm not advocating any of this. I mean, personally, like, I would be happy to see this all burn. Like, you know, that's just me. Like, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't have an investment in keeping the system around. I know plenty of people are, are happy with their devices, but for me, the question is to what end? Like, we're pumping these things out, why? So we can do more of it, so we can continue to perpetuate the same alienating, atomizing, depressing, like, cultural atmosphere? It just, it doesn't make sense to me. If, if there's no clear intention and purpose that actually presents a, a good, then why have it in the first place? I tend to have the hope that by coming here we will all wake up and advocate that. Thanks for the question. One more. Oh. Hi, thanks again for the talk. I think you're presenting a lot of necessary criticism and skepticism in this whole um, kind of bubble. Um, but I am wondering, what do you actually then see as an appropriate role for psychedelics in the necessary transformation or transition that humanity needs to go through in order to actually make it through this industrial capitalist um, landscape? <laughs> yeah, so for me it comes back to integration. I mean, my first psychedelic experience was with mushrooms and, you know, I, I shared the ex uh, experience last time at Boom. It's actually up online, so I'll, I'll avoid sharing the whole thing. But basically, the entire trip focused on the, the tension between, uh, you know, uh, ecology and industrial civilization, my own place within it, and things of that nature. And I think that you know, I, I don't really, as you know, I don't necessarily have a hopeful message. I think that people need to find ways to plug in locally to, to figure out what's going on, where they live, where they're rooted. You know, I can't tell you what resistance looks like in your area because I don't know, you know, what the infrastructure looks like. But for me, I mean, that was uh, a moment of sort of radical synthesis where you know, I left that, I did, uh, or following that experience, I engaged with a number of different groups uh, involved in various activities, both ecologically focused and economically focused. Um, you know, it, it included a lot of really joyful moments. It also included having uh, long rifles pointed at me by SWAT team folks uh, and a variety of things in between. I, I think that the kind of questions about moving forward and what do we do, you know, I think maybe it's a bullshit answer, but we do what we can. Um, we try to find ways that I think we can find leverage against the system. So for me, one of the questions is like, when, when you see people out in your street, right? So, so where I live, when the cops kill an, a, another, you know, young black kid, like, and you see people in the streets, what do you do? Do you join them? Do you find a way to support them? Do you sit at home and post things on social media, you know, or, or when there's, you know, engagement against various ecological, uh, you know, attacks on the land base, on our water supply, on, you know, whatever. Again, you know, what do you do when you see that? Do you find a way to plug in? Do you sit at home and, and think that the world is all shit and going to hell? Like, I don't necessarily see a way out of where we're at, but at the same time, like, when I find the opportunities to sort of leverage my insights and my own experience of the interconnectedness of life on this planet, of ecology, I think finding ways to leverage that against the dominant systems, cultures, whatever, you know, it, it's sort of a necessity. And I don't know that there's ever a clear answer. You know, I think, I think what it doesn't look like, I don't think it looks like nice, well-behaved marches through the streets of New York. I don't think it looks like, you know, more signatures on uh, ballot initiatives submitted to the government asking for change. 
I think we've seen that that if we want to actually see change, we need to, to actually see direct action. And I think that that requires people getting off their ass, getting out and doing things that are frankly dangerous. Like if if we're actually serious about creating a new world, like that needs to be created. It's not just gonna happen. But if there's follow up, I'm happy to. She wanted to, to follow up with that. It, sh it should be on. There's Is it on? Okay. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome answer. I'm running a company that's focused on sustainable transitions and sustainable development in the Netherlands, and I'm doing this kind of work every day. But one of the questions, I mean, I'm wondering specifically about psychedelics and the role that you see of those in that transition because a lot of what you've said is about caution and you're actually uh, an activist figure in the psychedelics arena so it's interesting to see that you're pushing back against their use in a way um oh i wouldn't say i'm pushing so so for me okay just to be clear like i i would say i subscribe to like an open source diy ethos like for me the role of psychedelics in this change is is you know, it's through models like Share the Seeds, it's through models like the DMT Nexus. Like, I'm, I always, I was commenting to a friend and he just told me I'm too big of a, a drug nerd and that's why, but I, I always get a little surprised when, when I talk to somebody and they say, oh, you know, I've got my changa. It's like, oh, really? Like, what did you make it with? And, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't make it. I, I bought it. And for me, like, changa is such an incredible, whatever, you know, drug. Um, that the notion that people would, would skip the, the extraction process, that people would skip, you know, getting to choose what herbs they infuse onto and how they do it, you know, to me, it, it boggles the mind. But ideally, my approach would be to, to put these tools or access to these tools into the hands of everyone and, you know, hope for the best in some senses. Uh, you know, looking at the number of people that we encounter in spaces like these who've had messages about ecological integrity, who've had experiences that make them feel like they can step beyond the social domination and alienation. I mean, to me, these things are sort of the catalysts. You know, these are the things that, that okay, if they, if they happen in broad daylight, that's great. But ultimately, like, I think these should be the behind the scenes. This should be the, you're at home, you have these realizations, you're on a, a camping trip or something, you have these realizations, you integrate, maybe you use them to process some of the traumas that you engage from trying to do real work. You know, I know that there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with NGOs. Uh, that wouldn't be, that, that's one way forward, but it wouldn't be my hope to be the only way. Jeremy Narby does some incredible work, uh, you know, trying to, or was doing some incredible work, I'm not sure if it's still going on, trying to secure uh, indigenous land rights and things of that nature. But, you know, we see the glimpses. For me, I guess it would be a, a desire to sort of see the glimpses of the psychedelic you know, behind all of the actions, to sort of see it filter through in ways where you get a sense that it's there, but that's not the focus because the real work is in the integration, right? The real work is in actually coming back to the world and like doing something with all of the things we've encountered. Great, so we have to leave it at that, but if anyone wants to talk, we can continue to chat. <laughs>